We have a very special guest to open the next phase of our conversation. Words really matter. Words hide truths, words expose truths, they give voice to what needs to be said. It is the substrate of humanity, language, communication, and we have a master of words with us. He is a poet, he is a playwright, his name is Philip Wilcox. He's going to join us throughout the meeting over the next two days. He won the 2015 to 16 Australian Poetry Slam. He's performed internationally across Australia. He works in schools, at conferences, at festivals. He is a master of words. Welcome, Phil, Phil Wilcox. So um, I'm not a healthcare professional. Um, I, I'm, I'm here to write poems about the conference. So these poems, I normally write poems and I, you know, I take a while to carefully construct them. This poem I'm about to give, uh, pre present uh, was written about this conference uh, and was written in the last hour or so. Um, and I'm not going to use my notes. I'm going to try and go off my head. So if, if I seem to stutter, please, please be gentle. Um, but, but before I start, um, I know, I know this is a, it's a bit of a weird thing to, you know, have someone doing poetry at a mental health conference. Uh, or maybe it's not. I don't know. Um, um, uh, I, uh, I want us to get into the spirit of it. And there's this one thing that happens with spoken word poetry, which is uh, a lot of what I do. Um, and it's sort of a collaborative, um, interactive experience. So if you hear something that you like, that resonates with you, that you think is, I don't know, uh, true or beautiful or funny or whatever, um, I want you to let me know. And the, the, the best way to do that is, uh, is by doing this. So can we all have a go at clicking? Yeah. And we're going to practice some clicking. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of excerpts from some poems that aren't actually, they're not, they're not mine, but they're really good. So we should get a lot of clicks for these lines. Um, uh, points for guessing what they are. All right. So uh, Another thing we can do apart from clicking is if you like what you hear, you might, you might do like one of these guttural grunts, you know, like a, mm. <laughs> you know, like half orgasm, half southern gospel choir. Mm. I want to hear a lot of that. Um, okay, this, this first uh, little excerpt to practice our clicking before we start the poem. Uh, here we go. <laughs> so there should be a lot of clicking. I'm going to try and do, maybe I'll try and do this in a, in a really slammy kind of beat poetry style, even though it's T.S. Eliot. Here we go. <laughs> Let us go now, you and I. When the evening is spread out, more clicking please, against the sky like a patient etherized upon the table. T.S. Eliot, yeah, thank you. All right, next one. Lots of clicking, maybe some more grunting this one. Mm, oh. Front row, Faye, I love it. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration Fines. All right. Yeah. Okay. And maybe a little bit of um, a little bit of Kanye to finish us off. <laughs> I'm living in the future, so my present is the past. My presence is a presence. Kiss my ass. Okay. Good. Cool. Pick the odd one out. Okay. We got a spectrum. All right. So this poem I wrote today. Um, uh, I was trying to write a poem, uh, and it was a wonderful talk from Tom Kama. Um, there's certain things I don't think I'm qualified to speak on uh, directly, and I think maybe the indigenous experience is what you don't, we, we don't need another white narrative story about that. Um, but I want to do a poem uh, about Australia and what it means to live in this sort of, in this country, especially with, with regards to mental health. But I haven't quite finished it yet. I'm going to do that this afternoon. And this first poem I wrote because a lot of things while I was in this room uh, stirred up some memories for me. Um, like many of you, I uh, have experienced um, uh, mental health uh, issues uh, personally with the people I know. Um, and so I, there's three stories in this poem. 
The first story is this woman, uh, this elderly woman who went to my family's church, who when she was younger, she would belt out the hymns. She just loved singing. She would do opera whenever, and, 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 and it, it would make her sore. But something happened. I'm, I'm not quite sure what happened, but um, something happened which made her, her speech slur, which made her not be able to sing like she used to. She used to make noises uh, like, uh, uh, and she'd get excited during the hymns, but, uh, and she would still sing, but it would not be words. So there's that one story. There's also the story of my best friend who went out with a girl in high school who, in my dumb ignorance, I never realized why she always wore uh, long sleeves in, in summer. Like, I just didn't register. I just thought that was her style. Um, and, and for a while, he didn't know either. Um, and um, just the discovery of, of, of what that meant for her and for him. And, and the last is my dad. One night when I was a kid, I went into the kitchen because I couldn't sleep. And my dad would sometimes go through these spells where he was just a bit absent and he wasn't, wasn't really present in the house. But I saw him with his head just resting on the kitchen table and his arms outstretched. And it scared me because my dad was meant to be this strong figure. And he came clean with me and he said, he told me about his depression and how he struggled with it and how he would keep it a secret. So I was thinking about these stories and then thinking about things that you guys experience and then thinking about uh, where we might be going and where the sort of day we look for and the sort of hope that we look for. And so this is a poem of hope, hopefully. <laughs> Here we go. It's a long intro. The day is done. My dear sweet son, I am old and you are young, but the time will come when pigeons will tap on asphalt, causing cracks that splinter into fissures, broadening to serpentine rivers, and, and from these gorges will pour forth all the gorgeous dormant voices ever stolen from every church lady that ever sung, and the day is done, but the time will come when in groups of 101, every Dalmatian, Alsatian, King George Spaniel, Cocker Spaniel, Collie, Kelpie, Rottweiler and Chihuahua will snap free from their leashes and they'll jump in the back of speeding utes whose destination is west and somewhere near sunset. And the day is done, but the time will come when the sea won't just wave, but will kiss mountaintops. The mountaintops will like the taste and the day is done but the time will come when everybody's chocolate money will melt and children will make bangles from the casing and ice chests on kitchen tables will be split in two and honey will pour forth like waterfalls and manta rays will return from their exile to their rightful home in the sky, engulfing the stars one by one. The day is done but the time will come when every young boyfriend girlfriend and lover of someone who self-harms will fill suburban healthcare centers searching for the one who writes calligraphy on their arms. Scarred skin will reach out. Smooth skin will meet it. The time will come when the lovers will roll up their sleeves, caress every bump and valley on pox skin, reading the wounds they missed like braille while smoothing the wrinkles like velvet icing on butter cake. The day is done, but the time will come when there will be no more secrets, and everyone will have the name of their beloved tattooed on their forehead, and while most people will have their own name written there, some will have Nan, Dimple Cheek Man, Nurse Tortari from Year 10. And the day is done, but the time will come when thunder will finally be victorious. And lightning will try to revive that shattered sky and sky will bleed. Sense of crushed gum leaves, lover's sheets and Christmas cherries prompting every eye to look upward. Through the kaleidoscope of the sky's gaping wound expecting angels. But the angels turn out to be tattoo youth workers, Maori case workers, secret smokers, canteen servers and everyone will turn around and say of course 
and then they'll fight over funding for it all. <laughs> and the day is done. My dear sweet son, I am old and you are young, but the time will come. Thank you guys. Before you go though, we're gonna wrap with the brilliant Phil Wilcox, who is bringing heart and soul to this meeting on your behalf. Thank you, Phil, welcome back. Hey guys, I know you probably want to want to scoot, so um, I'm going to be quick. I um, I wrote uh, actually I wrote two poems this afternoon. Um, one of them is uh, in honour of Faye, and is she here? Is she in the room? Ah, oh, there she is. Uh, <laughs> this poem is called "O oh, Faye." Yeah, this is a good practice font poem for the clicking, yeah. It's a very short poem. <laughs> Ofe. Your talk was so passionate. It moved to Naples and had furious, furious sex with a middle-aged woman who was reading Eat, Pray, Love. Mmm. <laughs> Faye, your talk was so deep. It was reading... James Joyce's Ulysses eating quinoa in a graveyard. Your talk was so fiery, National Park Services has banned it from the Great and Blue Mountains area. Your talk was so honest, if you asked it, does my butt look big in this, it would say, yes, and what are you going to do about it? Faye, your talk was so weird and wonderful, and truthful, and honest, that I think everyone here needs to give you another big clap for that talk. We had a talk had just a talk earlier just about earlier. technology. Technology. Oh, it's a bit echoey. A bit echoey. Um, I'm gonna be um, using one of these things before. You might have seen them. It's, um, it's um, Blackberries in the White House. Blackberries in the White House. Blackberries in the White House. Yes, we can. In the White House. Yes, we can. In the White. It's a loop pedal. Um, I'm going to be creating a poem uh, of different sounds. And the reason I'm doing this is because uh, I was thinking, especially with the talk earlier um, this morning, uh, thinking about Australia. What does it mean uh, to sort of exist in the the climate that we exist in, um, the political climate, the, the kind of climate that you guys work in. And I, I'm just an outsider. I'm just observing and writing things down. So I, I wrote this poem using the framework of, of a storm, of Australia as a storm and different sounds within a storm. Um, all right, I'm going to see, see how this goes. Here we go. My country sounds like a thunderstorm. Like a... Like the battering of tin roofs in the summer rain. The omnipresent hi-hat pittering and pattering. The heavy metal addicted cicadas chattering with daddy long legs tickling capillaries. Prickling thong lines on sunburnt feet. And even when the termites are asleep. And even when these rains won't keep that tis tisking complains like a ball sack itch. The white noise of our Protestant muscle twitch, a tisk tisk of women being told they'd never work again. A tisk tisk of stiff upper lips, stifling emotion. A tisk tisk of maraca packets of 30 pills clacking. A tisk tisk of grant applications being rejected, a tisk tisk of suburban sprinklers tutting in disapproval, an audio pesticide to keep the poppies from growing, a tisk tisking to keep the unwell from groaning while the ravens are outside our chamber doors. My country sounds like a thunderstorm, like a... Red chest cavity, 
beating in aortic pentameter, baseline rupture of a land spasming from baptismal water, competing with the two-step boom bap of a coastline, seducing this island to peer over the horizon. My country sounds as ancient as a heart monitor and as young as a dawn service trumpeter. It sounds like the boom boom of war doors slamming. Like the boom boom of phase mic dropping. It sounds like the boom boom of department heads schmoozing. Like the boom boom of gates closing, compartmentalizing who's well and who's unwell. My country sounds like a thunderstorm, like a lightning crack. Rip and lash, snapping, ripping, convict, kanaka and black backs. The crack, crackety, snap, crackle, snare, crack of the Sydney Olympic starters, pistol crack. Lip smacker, slathering, tween lips. Christmas teaspoon, slapping pavlova like salt pan promises cracking. Like sugary politico smiles fracking. This crack, crack, in X Factor judges' voices. In our Sunday rejoices. In red lines on invoices. In our captain's choices my country sounds like a thunderstorm thanks guys thank you Cox, wonderful thank you phil wilcox give it up and i'd like to reintroduce our wonderful performance poet he's all yours and he's been synthesising in his unique way what he's been gleaning and hearing at your leadership forum. Welcome, Philip. Welcome. Um, I read the poem that I have writ written this morning, uh, mostly over that, that talk. It um, really, really was powerful. Um, I'm going to just uh, lighten it up a little bit. Um, uh, I wrote this poem... Um, a long time ago, so this is not one that I wrote uh, today. This is a poem uh, about slam poetry, and it's super serious, guys. Um, so if you can get your clicks out ready for this one so we can get in the mood for it. It's called I Am A Slam Poet. Here we go. I begin. With my head held low, letting you know I'm holding back a flood of emotion. I pause, four seconds, one, two, three, I am a slam poet. So if I hold my hands out like this and move them like this, then maybe you'll believe me even when I speak with this lilt. Half Gregorian monk, half fifties beatnik. See, I need no formal meter to speak to you because my affected staccato, which wobbles to vibrato, can go high and go low. And when it goes low, you know it's deep. I am a slam poet, and I'm speaking to you from here. Ona mata pia, ona mata pia. I love the word synapses. I love that the moon has a dark side. I love that. It's versatile. I love using lighthouses as metaphors. I love whispering absurd throwaway non sequiturs. Love is a Snickers bar. It rarely satisfies. I am a slam poet, and in my final rant, my hands dance, helping me conjure wonder as my voice gets louder and louder. My words seem profounder and profounder until I stop. The slightest crack in my voice, an almost imperceptible nod. I am a slam poet, and now you know it. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> now for a poem about trauma. Okay. Um, I, uh, here we go. Um, I might use my notes during this a few times. I'm not a mental health professional, but it seems to me that Maybe the pain and violence and trauma itself is like energy. 
It's hard for it to be created. It's hard for it to be destroyed. And in the beginning, there was a garden, but a garden is built on violence. And ever since the first civilization in the fertile crescent irrigated life into the desert, there were locusts and swallows to swallow the locusts and snakes to snatch the swallows and jackals for the snakes and at the top, eagles. And maybe it came in a meteorite. Maybe it hovered in Cretaceous dust and settled into crevasses where it settled into molasses and maybe it's now pumped back in the air for a second extinction in slow-mo. And you know it when you see it. It used to like gladiator battles and now likes dogfights, cockfights and political elections. It financed St. Peter's Basilica. It financed Trump Tower. It financed the Tower of Babel. And sometimes you can see it in the gleam, the black gleam of an embryonic shark who ate her sisters in utero. And sometimes you see it dancing in circus mirrors, distorting reflections of teenage girls. Sometimes you see it in the handprint of a niece on her dress from her uncle. Sometimes it hovers in alcoholic breath as he beats his chest and sometimes it whispers in the ears of Pacifica teens in the middle of the night, just do it, just do it, just do it. You know it when you see it. But energy, it's hard for it to be destroyed. So maybe your job then is you're the story collectors. You're the energy transfers because if energy can't be destroyed maybe it can be transferred maybe it can be dissolved maybe it can be dispersed so when it settles down and fossilizes in the throat when it settles in the oil pits in the stomach when it freezes and causes glacial grazing in the head drain the oil pit Smash the sedimentary rock like geologists with bloody heart palms wielding sledgehammers and stare into the glacial silence of the head and collect stories. Sometimes see your cracked reflection. Sometimes see the warped reflection in the ice and stare until it melts. Stare again until it melts some more and then put the cup out and collect the water, strap it to some dynamite and let it explode like fireworks. Let it disperse because energy cannot be created. It can not be destroyed but you're the story collectors so let it disperse thanks guys thank you we're going to start this afternoon um, with some high energy with um, Phil Wilcox our poet um, and then we'll be going into the closing session with Fran Silvestri Eddie Bartnick myself and then the Swedish delegation um, Frederick Linden Cronin and uh, Sherston Evelius. Um, so I will call on Phil Wilcox. Thank you. Uh, over lunch, I put together a whole bunch of your uh, little um, snippets of paper of what you will not be seen in 2025. Um, but before I do this poem, which is a poem that essentially is written by all of us here with a few little cuts. There was some, some things I had to cut, um, some weirdly specific things about a CEO in the Netherlands. <laughs> that, that goes out to the Dutch in the room. Yeah, um, I thought I'd leave that one out. Um, uh, but before I do that poem, um, I'm going to share with you guys to get us into the, the clicking kind of mood so we can really click for the poem that we as you have essentially written with one of the worst poems ever written. Uh, this is a poem that a 14-year-old version of myself, this is what I wrote, a love poem I wrote in geography. Um, yeah, I had to email it to myself. I, I still had it on a Word document somewhere. I don't know why I saved it, uh, but here we go. It's called, I Tolerate You. So get ready to start clicking. I tolerate you. I tolerate the hell out of you. I'm all up in your space, not given two flying fluffs, not eating this Maxibon. 
because I'm too busy tolerating the shit out of you. But I think it's too soon to say love. <laughs> I like you. Not as much as a Maxibon, but maybe as much as a chicken nugget. Yeah, I like you like a chicken nugget. Made from all the ground up punchlines from our childhood. I like you like Gen Y likes to like like. And I like you like a simile. What am I doing here? And I think it's time to say I miss you. I miss you. I miss you like the desert rain misses nothing. It's inanimate. Why would it miss anything? I miss you like our unhappily married teacher misses her miss. That's the best joke in the whole poem. <laughs> Lol jokes, not that much. I tolerate you. The end. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So after the worst poem ever written, this is a poem written by you guys. Um, by 2025, there will be no reason not to dance. There will be no suicide among young people. There will be no constantly reinventing the wheel, no congregated, segregated services. There will be no Fitbit only dedicated to exercise. They will be well-being apps. There will be no disability identity. There will be no disposable coffee cups that can't be recycled. There will be no need to respond to crises in our lives because the practice of prevention has lead to healing outcomes. There will be no suicides, discrimination, special schools, custodial services, diagnoses, housing issues, waffles. <laughs> I don't know why that's in there. This is a really long one. There will be no division between mental health services and general community. They will be on, there will only be disparity between... No, I'm just going to miss that one. Um, you can, it'll be up in the foyer. You can check it later. By 2025, there will be no token cultural effort. There will be no President Trump. There will be no President Trump again. There will be no Trump. And there will be no President Trump. <laughs> There will be no do what diddly diddly do what do. I don't know. Okay, there will be a strong voice. There will be no there will, for disabled people, and disabled people will be in control of government policy. There will be no family waiting for the right supports when their child is diagnosed with a disability. There will be no short-term funding of 12 months or less. There will be no us and them. There'll be no child experiencing family trauma or abuse who goes unnoticed or unsupported. There'll be no people with mental illness issues who are isolated in the community. There'll be no involuntary admissions to hospitals. There'll be no burnt out and disillusioned mental health clinicians. There'll be no young people who take their own lives. There'll be no stigma related to mental health issues. There'll be no more suicide in healthcare, no more bad hair days. There'll be no need for mental health, health services. So guys, you're sort of essentially out of a job, hopefully. Hopefully, by 2025. The end. Well done, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Before I get off this stage, I just want to say it's uh, from someone who's an outsider, who, who's, who's not so much in this world, it's been an honour to sit in and, and learn and, and soak up some of the, the wisdom and the different opinions and the heated discussions and the stifling tension in certain bits. And uh, I, I just want to say you guys are, you guys are inspiring. Uh, I, I got home yesterday and I just couldn't stop talking about what I'd heard. So, so thank you uh, for letting me be a fly in the wall and um, I wish you all the best for the rest of the conference. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>